Welcome to the Betting Above the Rim podcast. Today's date, Valentine's Day, February 14th, episode 29 of today's podcast. And I figured we'd do something a little bit different to start. We're going to go with three topics, or four, but three and four kind of linked together. First off, as a longtime suffering Nick fan, I'm going to give you the five players that broke my heart the most as a Nick fan since I've been alive. Next, we'll look at the triple-double by Webb and Yama a couple nights ago with blocks. How much has this game grown, and what is the ceiling for Webb and Yama? Third, last night, they retired Shaq's jersey. I'm going to talk about Shaq's impact with the Orlando Magic and lead it right into my bench and my starting five for Orlando. Welcome to the Betting Above the Rim podcast, and let's get started as a Knicks fan. And I'll tell you, folks, as a Knicks fan, it's rough. I know it's been orange and blue skies this year, but they've given me pain over the years. So these five people have given me so much pain, sleepless nights as a Knicks fan, and we're going to kind of focus in that area of the early 90s to the last time the Knicks were really relevant That would be the Carmelo Amari Stoudemire era with Mike Woodson as the head coach. And let's get started with Reggie Miller. Hall of Famer, 18.2 points per game. What a great shooter. Five-time All-Star, three-time NBA. And, oh, I mean, can we just talk about some of the things that Reggie Miller has done? And, folks, the crazy thing about this is, is I can do this off the top of my head. I don't even have to go and look at notes with this because this is how ingrained this stuff is in my head. How about with Reggie Miller? The 25-point third quarter performance against the Knicks in 95 playoffs when he gave the choke sign to Spike Lee and every Knicks fan wanted to kick Spike Lee's ass because he was talking way too much junk during that game. How about the eight points and I think six seconds, game one, 1995, hits a three. Then he pushes Greg Anthony to the ground. I don't know how they call a foul on that one. And then he turns around, gets a three, hits another one, then gets fouled later on. It's two free throws and a game one upset at MSG, which ended up with the Pacers finally beating the Knicks in seven games. That is the infamous Patrick Ewing missed finger roll at the buzzer. And while Reggie has killed the Knicks, there's been a respect factor, I think, that this come along with Reggie, because I think Reggie embraced the role of being a villain. So you young kids, I think about like when Trey Young goes to the guard and makes big performances, think about 20 years before and doing it year after year after year. That was Reggie Miller in the playoffs and some of the great battles that the Knicks and the Pacers had. Next up, I mean, <laughs> You got to go Mike, right? You got to go with Michael Jordan, all-time greatest player of all time, 14-time All-Star, six-time champion, five-time MVP, six-time finals MVP, 30-point per game in his career, Hall of Famer. And, I mean, oh, my Lord. The Knicks never beat Jordan in the playoffs. Let me repeat that. The Knicks never beat Michael Jordan once in the playoffs, and he knocked them out nearly every year. I remember when they got Riley, and we thought this was the team. And we and here, remember, folks, 1994, Knicks are the one seed. They win games one and two in MSG. Everybody thinks this is a downfall of the, of the Bulls, right? You know, the I'm sorry, not, I'm sorry, 1993 playoffs. I should say 94, 1993 playoffs. And then what happens? The articles in the Daily News and the New York Post about Michael Jordan going to Atlantic City in between Game 1 and Game 2. Well, that done woke Michael Jordan up. Because Michael Jordan was probably ready to retire at that point anyway. Remember that 54 piece he gave them in Game 4? Yeah, the Knicks never won a game the rest of the series. How about when he retired? He came back in 95. The double nickel game. 55-point performance that he had. And the fact that every year Patrick Ewing used to say, this is our year. This is our year. 
and it never was New York's year. You know when it was New York's year? Do you know when the two times that the Knicks went to the finals when George, when when uh, when Patrick Ewing, ready, ninety four, the year that uh, Mike did not play because he retired in ninety three for a little bit, came back during the ninety five season, right, and ninety nine. The year after Jordan retired the second time from the Bulls after the second three-peat. No matter what the Knicks did, no matter who they brought in, you know, Gerald Wilkins, John Starks, I mean, Derek Harper, Greg, they, they, Jesus, they could put anybody on Jordan. Jordan would roast the Knicks, and he is the biggest reason why the New York Knicks have not won an NBA championship since 1973. Third on the list, P.J. Brown. You're going to say, who? P.J. Brown. And that picture of P.J. Brown is from when he's with the Celtics. But P.J. Brown is part of one of the most notorious fights in the history of the NBA playoffs. I will take you to 1998, I do believe. 90 or 97. Knicks and Heat are in brawl in a crazy rivalry. If you remember, folks, uh, that's back in the day when uh, Pat Riley was the coach of the Knicks at one point, left on a fax letter in 1995, and that he turned around and he went to Miami and he was like Benedict Arnold. Well, they had some wars with Van Gundy, right? And obviously as the coach of the Knicks at that point, who was his assistant. But I'll take you back. P May 14th, 1997. Game number five of the Eastern Conference, I do believe, semifinals. And they get, there is a fight at the end of the court where P.J. Brown flips over Charlie Ward, all hell breaks loose. Well, the Knicks Got guys that run onto the floor and get involved into the fight. And it led to ejections and suspensions. And it really changed a lot of what the NBA does and how they deal with, um, you know, fighting and, and, and how you're supposed to um, – can't leave the bench or anything like that. And if I remember right, uh, the fight took place at game five, but then what you had is a bunch of Knicks were suspended for part of game six and game seven, right? In game seven, I think, or five Knicks got suspended. Ewing, Houston, Starks, Larry Johnson, Charlie Ward. So the Knicks lost game six and game seven and out of their five guys, you got to realize, folks, those were five out of their top six guys got suspended over the course of that series. New York was up three games to two. They lost it four games to three. I'll never forget, forgive P.J. Brown for what he did to my New York Knicks. Next up on the list, Steph Curry. You're like, wait, what? Steph Curry? Do you know why, folks? When Steph Curry was drafted in the NBA, and we we can sit there and talk about the accolades of Steph Curry, 10-time All-Star, four-time NBA champion. We know a finals MVP in 21-22. Phenomenal career. He was the number seven pick of the NBA draft. Do you know who had number eight? The Knicks. And the Knicks took, drum roll please, Jordan Hill. I mean, <laughs> you, you you talk about you know what to 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 sugar to you know what or backwards. I can't say it, but they took Jordan Hill. Now they could have took Demar Derozan right after that, right? Who, who obviously had a great career. They're going to took Drew Holiday, who went 17th that year. There were so many great players that have come out of that draft. But Steph Curry, and if you watch, you ask people, he actually wanted to go to New York. 
and New York did not win the lottery. Obviously, they got the eighth draft pick. They drafted Jordan Hill. Steph has done Steph, and the Knicks have done the Knicks. Last up on my list, I'll give you another name. You're like, who? Folks, Roy Hibbert. You're like, what? Who, who, who the hell is Roy Hibbert? And I want to go back to the great series that took place between the Knicks and the Pacers. And I would call it the block heard around the world. Knicks, are, let's put it to you. Let me, let me paint the scenario for you, right? The Knicks are in a battle with the Pacers. Five minutes left. Knicks are up by two. Carmelo beats Paul George baseline. Oh, here comes a dunk. 94-90 lead. Knicks go. Boom. They win. And then that would be the turning point of the series. There's only one problem. Roy Hibbert met him at the rim. He met him at the rim. Pacers go on and outscored the Knicks 16-7. And that was the end of the series. And that was the last time, folks, before this run that Tibbs has got with the Knicks where the Knicks were even relevant as a franchise. I've still got pain. Roy Hibbert. Roy Hibbert. Cost my Knicks probably the best season they've had until we've gotten to the Tibbs, Jalen Brunton era. So those are the guys that broke my heart. Another guy that kind of broke my heart. It's Webinyama. Because I wish he was on the Knicks. And look at this performance on Webinyama a couple of nights ago. 27 points, 5 rebounds, 14, re uh, 14 rebounds, 5 assists, and 10 block shots. First rookie since 1990 to get a triple-double with blocks. Last player to record a triple-double with blocks was Click Capella two years ago. And the game of... Victor Wabanyama, folks, continues to accelerate. And he has been so good for San Antonio. And, folks, we don't even talk about Rookie of the Year award anymore. Like, it's Wabanyama. Can you 20.4 points per game, 10.1 rebounds, 3.2 assists, 3.2 blocks, right? But it, it's the play of Wabanyama, you know, as of late. What he has done, you know, particularly that month of January where he gave you 24 points per game, 9.6 rebounds, 3.3 assists, 3.3 blocks. For a San Antonio team, has played better. Now, folks, part of this can be about the fact that they have put Calvin Johnson to the bench and have given Webinyama more time. Folks, Victor Webinyama is a generational talent. And I will say this. Victor Webinyama could go down one of the greatest basketball, basketball players of all time. He is a freak of nature. He is Haley's Comet. He is the unicorn. He is the alien. He is whatever you want to call him. There's been nothing like him. And his play has been fantastic. And it's the reason why Pop looks so damn young now is because of the play of Victor Webiyama. Fantastic performance by Wemby. Let's end this on a, on a two-part segment. And let's first talk about Shaquille O'Neal a.k.a. the big Aristotle, a.k.a. the big legendary, a.k.a. Shaq Fu, a.k.a. Shaq Diesel, a.k.a. the Diesel, whatever you want to call him. Shaquille O'Neal's career has been absolutely fantastic. I want to take away the Cleveland-Boston years and just stick with the Orlando Lakers heat career. Shaq would... Miami was at, and I'm sorry, Orlando was absolutely fantastic. Getting you 27.2 points per game, 12.5 rebounds, 2.8 blocks, 58% from the floor, four-time All-Star. Rookie of the year, three-time All-NBA. Folks, he was three-time All-NBA. And think about when he played, folks. Shaq, Ewing, Robinson, Olajuwon. There's Olajuwon right there. Alonzo Mourning, 
And this guy was all NBA from year two. And how dominant Shaq was getting the Orlando Magic to the NBA Finals in 1995. And what a delight to watch Shaq play. Not just for, for how dominant he was, but he did it with a smile and a pizzazz and a, and a he, he made it fun. Right? Yes, he couldn't make free throws. I don't care. Shaquille O'Neal, one of the greatest basketball players of all time, and shout out to the Orlando Magic for retiring Shaq's number 32 and being the first Orlando Magic to have his number retired. So with that, let's go and let's end today's podcast with my all-time lineup for the Orlando Magic. Starting with the bench. Now, this was tough, folks. I went back and forth. With the bench, I went with Dwight Howard. Eight seasons, 18.4 points per game, 13 rebounds. Led the NBA in rebounding four times. Blocks twice. Six-time All-NBA. Five-time All-Defensive. Three-time Defensive Player of the Year. Took Orlando to an NBA Finals. Dwight Howard, absolutely fantastic uh, career that he had. And one of these players that, you know, I look at some of these centers like if he didn't have the bad back. And Patrick Ewing didn't have the bad knees. I would have loved to have seen what Dwight Howard's career would have been for his totality. Obviously, Dwight Howard, fantastic career with the Orlando Magic. Next up, Rashard Lewis. Four seasons at 16.3 points per game, 5.1 rebounds, 42% from the 44% from the floor, 40 from three. One time all star. Folks, Rashard Lewis. I'm going to explain this to you, the young kids, was the original stretch four, right? A four that could take you inside off the bounce, but could really shoot the ball from three. A very underrated player, only played four seasons in Orlando. Remember, he started his career with the Seattle Supersonics. How about this point guard? How about Scott Skiles? Guys may not have heard of him. Only five seasons, first five years in the NBA. 12.9 12.9 points per game, 7.2 assists, 38% shooting from three. Really smart cerebral player. 1991 most improved player. I ended up being an NBA coach. I do believe we're Orlando, I'm not mistaken. And was a starting point guard before Penny Hardaway got there. And he did have a, a game where he got 30. They wish to do it this way. 30 assists in the game. Scotty Skiles. How about 3D? Dennis Scott. Seven seasons, 14.8 points per game, 40.3% shooter, all rookie, 1991. Part of one of the great college nickname teams of all time, Lethal Weapon 3. It was right when Lethal Weapon 3 just came out, and it was him, Brian Oliver, and Kenny Anderson at Georgia Tech for the great Bobby Kremens. Dennis Scott, one of the great, great shooters of the early to mid-1990s. And at the, How about another bit? How about Nikola Busevich? Now, you think about him and his game with Chicago. Remember, folks, this is a nine seasons he played in Chicago, Orlando. 17.6 points per game, 10.8 rebounds per game, one-time All-Star. Let's go to the starting lineup. At the point, Anthony Penny Hardaway. Kids, you may know him as the coach of Memphis. I know him as an unbelievable point guard. What, like, he was... An athletic Magic Johnson. How about that? He was Magic Johnson, but more belts in his game. Not as great as a passer, but very underrated passer, I would say. Six seasons, 19 points per game, 6.3 assists per game, 4.7 rebounds, four-time All-Star, three-time All-NBA, NBA All-Rookie team. And I will say this. If Shaq and Penny did not break up, along with Dennis Scott, who's on that team, along with the next guy on his team, I'm about to mention, they would have won an NBA championship. They 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 panicked. They panicked after getting to the finals in 95, getting swept by 96 by the Bulls, and then Shaq was gone, and Shaq was on his way to the Lakers. I think it's one of Shaq's biggest regrets. Pretty good documentary that ESPN did on, on that. Uh, Nick Anderson at the two, 10 seasons, 15.4 points per game, 36.3% from three. Nick Anderson was a very, very good player, very underrated player, and he gets noted for his four missed free throws in game one of icing the 1995 finals versus the Houston Rockets. And Nick Anderson was a fantastic player, could shoot the ball, 
and just a shame. With the Sacramento, had a good career, but it's a shame what happened to him after that kind of that kind of roller coaster of game one. Kind of, uh, I guess they, they call it the yips in baseball. Kind of got the yips with shooting the ball after that situation. At the three, T Mac. Oh, these four years were fantastic. Twenty-eight point one points per game, seven rebounds, five point two assists. All star, all four years, All NBA, all four years. Two-time scoring champion. When he left Toronto to get his own team from Vince Carter, he was absolutely fantastic. And he became that next superstar as Penny and Shaq had left. Tracy McGrady, another player, if he didn't have injuries, all-time, all-time great. At the four, Hidu Turkoglu, eight seasons, 14.5 points per game. People remember Hidu Turkoglu. Very, very good player. People know more for his time with Sacramento. Was very, very good uh, with the Orlando Magic. And lastly, Shaquille O'Neal. I've already talked to him about him. 27.2 points per game, 12.5 rebounds per game. Shaq Foose. Once again, bench. Dwight Howard, Rashard Lewis, Scotty Skiles, Dennis Scott, Nikola Vucevic. Starters, Penny Hardaway, Nick Anderson, Tracy McGrady, Hedo Turkoglu, and Shaquille O'Neal. This has been Betting Above the Rim Podcast, episode 29. Happy Valentine's Day to everyone. And for all your information, folks, there's nothing better than the Sports Grid app. Everything that you need, pregame, in-game, post-game, props and predictions and more from the very best in the sports gambling business make sure you go download that app next episode will be next week on monday we'll start to look more into college basketball folks we're getting near march so it's go time i'm going to look to try and get some guests for Vinny and obviously for matt george who do a great job with this podcast i wouldn't do it without them we'll be back next week for another episode of betting above the rim podcast and remember folks it's smarter to be on sports great tonight. <laughs>